I wonder if I could ask you what would be some things that that you would admire most in Christianity or in a Christian. If I remember the early years of my life when I was quite young, in the Christian faith and so forth, even as a boy, I would look to men or preachers, I should say preachers, and sometimes individuals that left an impact on my life as being somebody stern, somebody you don't want to cross their path. That's the estimation that I had of a real preacher. Then as I was baptized with the Holy Spirit later on in life, I began to look for people that had power in their lives. And there are some things that I look for that I'm, I look for that left a deep impression on me. And I would ask you to look back through your life. Some thought, who and what do you look to when you want to see or think of somebody that is really a a soldier for God. Is it somebody that is stern and you don't want to cross his path? I don't think we have that here. I don't think any of you are looking at that that way. Is it someone that has gone through a tremendous amount and they come out shining? Is it someone that when there is demonic issues, somebody has demons that they could cast them out? I wonder what is your opinion of what you're looking for as being someone that is a man of God. Someone that can pray for someone and there is a response. A miracle happen. I really wonder because I believe in those categories, most of us have had categories of things that we've been looking for. If I really meet a man of God, he will have this or he will have that. I've been moved by two different things specifically in my life, all through my life. Not a man of eloquent teaching is not one that has impressed me. A man that has really a way of preaching loud and long and hard in that has not impressed me. But what I have really, when I say impressed, I'm not looking at a man that has all the words framed in the right tone because a lot of times where I've observed that, I can admire the wisdom, or not the wisdom, or the product knowledge perhaps that is encased in someone like that. But I also see that there's powerlessness that it doesn't do anything to me. It just kind of blows my mind and I, huh. But you go away and it hasn't done a thing to you. I'm not, I'm not intrigued by talent behind the pulpit. Not at all. And I've never pursued that. Never pursued talent behind the pulpit. But there are some things that I have admired because of issues that I have seen in people's lives. I try to stand on the side so everyone can see me. Um, because of issues in people's lives that go undone and go un untouched and that people cannot, and there is no minister to deal with that issue. And I've seen that in the early stages of my Christian walk as a spirit-filled believer, that I've seen that there was one thing that really, really, really I longed for, and that is, I know that there's so many people that, are in, that have issues of witchcraft and, and depression and things like this, and where is a man that can pray for them like Jesus did, and they get healed? And I long for that. Not to have that power so people would admire, but that people could get help. And then the other thing is for someone that has really gone through a lot, and they come out and they're still smiling like Jacob leaning on a stick, has always drawn me. I marvel at what someone can go through and go through and go through, and they lift up their voice and they don't, they're not sad. There's gladness and there's life that comes out of them. Those two categories of Christians, I, can, I believe, can be all in one person. And when I look at Jesus, he was like that. He was the most despised of all that are despised. And he had more power than any man ever had to deal with demons and so forth. So when I look at that, I wonder, what is your thing? In fact, it would be so interesting to hear, time is late, I have a late start, because the singing was so good, maybe I should not even preach. 
I don't know, because I'm going to be running into some issues with time. Some of you are expecting to be dismissed already. Uh, the, um, hesitate a little bit here. Let me think here. I'll just have to think, as, think something else, I guess, as I talk a little bit here. I wonder, Steve, what has been the, the thing that you've admired in ministry? I'm going to ask you to say it. I didn't warn him of nothing. As something that you would admire as being a man of God. A man that t can take a lot of blows and keep on standing and going on. Yes. Yeah. Anybody want to volunteer something? Say what, what is would be in your opinion. <coughs> yes, Arlon. Kind, understanding, and powerful. Kind and understanding and powerful. Is there someone else? We'll have one more person if we could. Yes, John. Man that even though he has limitations, available to God and still goes on regardless of mistakes, and still gets up and still goes on, even knowing he is human. Mm-hmm. Amen. Now those three people of you that spoke, do you know people like that? Do you know someone like that? Do you know someone like that? Do you know someone like that? Amen. Very interesting. What will happen if we bring in a person that is absolute demon possessed and nobody can drive out a demon? See, that's a ministry that is lacking in our day. Because we've learned to explain it all as being bipolar. See, then there's... See, and part of that is dealing with demonic issues is if you give it names of modern terms, there is no bipolar demon. Same with sicknesses. And I can go on, and I, we're not getting into this kind of a thing, but I would like to just throw some things out to you so that you understand some things. I believe, today is a teaching again. Um... We notice that in the kingdom of God, that we have seen in, in messages that I've preached before this, that every time that the kingdom of God is set up, evil is separated from it. You see it in the Lord's Prayer. Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, that will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. Deliver us from evil. Why? Because it's your kingdom. Because you are king in this vessel. See, and the problem is, the kingdom problems that we have is we have other kings living inside that control that body, that control the desires. And we can name a whole bunch of them. Sports God, I believe, is one of the big ones. Sports and money. It's two gods that want to take control in someone's body, soul, and spirit. And the kingdom of God cannot be there. And when there is no kingdom power, then evil will prevail. I think I made it clear to, to those of you that have been hearing me that almost, not in every case, but in most cases, when Jesus brought the kingdom of God, he cast out devils. He got rid of darkness. It's very interesting. <clears throat> God, his first words that we read about, he said, let there be light. First words we know of anything about God is his, word, his first words were, let there be light. And his kingdom is about light. When you're in the midst of confusion... And someone sheds light on it. Ah! See, that's the first thing that the kingdom of God will do, is it will shed light on things. Light upon your life. Light in your life. He, Jesus came as a light. Um, there's a vast difference between good and evil and dark and light. People, I think we're living in a day when darkness and light has been so mixed together as gray. 
And it is so wrong, so devastatingly wrong. There is a vast difference between light and darkness. It doesn't even come close to mixing. The devil is far from God. And light is far from darkness. And unless we see that and it becomes clear to us, the kingdom of God will not become very plain. We struggle with unbelief, etc. and so forth. God has given his children, all his children, power over darkness and power over death, spiritually speaking. Remember the first words. Ever recorded, ever recorded about God in Genesis chapter 1 is let there be light. He came, he looked, it says the Spirit of God was around the globe somehow around this earth. And it was suspended somewhat. And he, God came to it, the Word came to it. And he says, first thing, he said, ah, light. First thing we need is light. And that's the first thing you and I need in our life is light. Light upon my life. Light upon the circumstances. Light upon this situation. And we know that Jesus is always light. He came as a light. Matthew 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. God and money. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and fame. You cannot serve God and sports. You can't. That's what the Bible says. And let me say, this is what I'm trying to explain today is the umbrella. Look at that. It's high enough so you can still see me. The umbrella. If we could say it somehow, I have it pictured here on my notes. If you could see it, it would be better. I have a blue umbrella. And I have a man standing right below that umbrella. And just because I'm standing below this umbrella when I preach today... It does not say that I'm always standing under the umbrella as I live. This umbrella is God. This umbrella is God's authority. As long as I'm under this umbrella, whatever God has, He passes it to me. And remember that when I am under God's authority, God's umbrella of authority, when I'm under this umbrella, then the power that I have is not my power. But when I step outside this, now I've, it's all me. And try to deal with demonic issues with your own power. You can't. Because devils are more powerful than humans. Sin is more powerful than humans. You can't quit sinning. When you come under this authority, now the power that God has is passed to you. Some of you think that's by birth. No, it's not. It's by walking. If you walk in the Spirit, doesn't say if you're born again you won't sin, but if you walk in the Spirit you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. doesn't say when you're born again you don't fulfill. It says if you walk in the Spirit. And remember, this is the trifold ministry of God. I could take another umbrella and put it up here, and that would be Jesus, and another one would be God, and this would be the Holy Spirit. But we'll do this as the Godhead. Of being under the authority of God. Now, we're going to go down through through things and we're going to explain some of the things at how some people respond to issues and things and some how some other people respond to issues and things. First of all, we'll take a we'll take a look. I'd like to talk about the centurion, but I won't a little bit later. Because Jesus seen a truth that the centurion seen that he said, Oh my, I've not seen this in the whole Israel. This is how it works. And I would like for you, if you could for a moment, rather than being critical about people that cast out devils or demons, if I bring a person in here that is demon-possessed, and I've seen them, and some of you have had demons, you know that. God has delivered you from them through Jesus. Now, 
Rather than, oh, I don't like when you talk about that. I don't like, I don't like, uh, I, I'm not, uh, let's, come on, let's not get carried away with it. I'd like to point you to come and deal with someone like that. And why, why can a man come up here and he can speak against in someone's life, he can speak life to someone, it doesn't do anything to him. Another man can speak life to someone and it works in him. Why does it work for some? <laughs> Sorry, umbrella here. Why does it work for some and not for others? Why is there more power in some people's life and not in others? Does it have to do with this? Or this? Remember, when you are not under authority, you are your own authority. And that's basically nothing. About as loud as you can yell. That's about it. But when you are under God's authority, you are under His power. That then radiates down and through your life, and it goes on out. And if you are married, you have a wife, and she is under your authority, the same works there. Um, let's go on through here. <clears throat> one thing that you will notice, someone that is walking under God's authority, you will have the one that is broken. The one under God's authority is a broken person. The one that is not under God's authority has had the same issues come to him to deal with him, and he's bitter. One is bitter, the other one is broken. You'll notice that. There's other things. The one that is under God's authority is holy. The one that is outside God's authority is unholy. He's not purified. The one under God's authority is surrendered. Why surrender? Because of pain and suffering and things that have come their way or his way or her way. And they surrender fully and deeper to Christ. The other one is, I will show you. Now, when I say these things, these are little things that you and I go through every day. And you have options to walk under the authority of God or walk outside the authority of God. And a lot of this, I'm talking about authority and I'm going to be talking about power later. There is a difference. Authority is one thing, power is another thing. There's a lot of people want power, but they do not want to be under God's authority. And what I notice when you deal with demonic issues, you have to have both or they will not go away. You'll have to have the authority of God and you have to have power also from God. There's two differences, power and authority. We'll talk about that. One thing that you'll notice, a person that is under the authority of God has joy. Because it comes from the Holy Ghost. You'll also notice a man under the authority of God has faith. A man outside the authority of God has unbelief. He doesn't believe God. The one under the authority of God believes God. And the Bible says if you believe, it'll work. Based in those words. If you have unbelief, it doesn't work. And this goes into numerous things in life, whether it's healing or other kinds of things that you're needing in your life. The sin of unbelief, it's even salvation, the fullness of salvation and so forth, that comes, does not come when you walk in unbelief. The children of Israel could not enter into rest because of not being under the authority of God, but they chose to believe their own thinking that God, you cannot and will not take care of us. When all they would have had to do is walk under the authority of God, and God could have made that they walked over into the wilderness in 40 days, rather than 40 years. Because they chose to walk under their own authority. What they thought best. This is better. I think I, and I think I can do this myself. I will somehow show God that I can love Him. God says, you can come under the authority of God. You cannot do that on your own. That's why I have sent your son. You know the story as we go on. <clears throat> One thing you'll notice also, that a man under the authority of God is kind. Kindness, like Arlen said, kindness. He's also only a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. He's a person that has been tested and perfected. He's a believer of the scripture. He has no biases. Well, I am biased today to think that, and it's based on religion, the way you've been brought up or not been brought up. You go from one extreme to another. You're biased. You have your biases. Under the authority of God, you have no biases. On your own authority, you have biases. This is the way I think it should be. 
Well, then keep thinking on that way. But you're outside from the authority of God. Under what authority are you when you have a bias? You understand what I'm saying? Perhaps from a religion that you've been part of. That is holding an umbrella over your head. And it's causing you to be under that authority rather than this authority. Let's move on. Under the authority of God, one thing is you will be a consecrated Christian. You've given yourself to be under the power of God. Forgiving, you'll, you'll forgive everybody. Everybody, you'll always forgive because God cannot forgive you if you do not forgive. It is a commandment. You have no options on this one. You have to absolutely forgive everybody that has ever failed and hurt you. Absolutely every last person. If not, you're outside from the authority of God. Because God says, in that case, I can't even forgive you. Forgiveness is something that is so essential. It's essential as food. You cannot live without it. You cannot be a Christian when you have unforgiveness in your heart. You absolutely cannot. It is impossible because God will not forgive you. You have to forgive everybody that has ever hurt you or failed you. And under the authority of God, you'll do that. And under the authority of God, you will not blame others. Others have caused your problems. No. That's not what it was. Outside the authority of God, you will have all kinds of other people to blame for this umbrella. Because they hold an umbrella over your head. You're under their authority, under their injustices. But when you walk under the authority of God, you walk in forgiveness of the sins of your past completely where God has asked you to walk. That is walking under the authority of God. Let's move on here. Under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, spiritual circumcision, full of the Holy Spirit. This is how you are when you're under the authority of God. When you're outside the authority of God, you will be a man of great knowledge, perhaps. You'll have a lot of intellectual value. Great memorization, perhaps. You can memorize everything you want to. You can memorize the whole Bible and be outside His authority. Memorization doesn't bring you under His authority. Obedience does, but not memorization. Sin in the flesh, pride, love of the praise of man. I wrote some things down. Fear of man, traditions of man, flesh, power, power to live in the flesh, fleshly, unholy. Unholy simply means not perfected by God. You will not allow God certain parts and certain areas in your life. He once started dealing with you in this certain place, and you said, no more. He'll hold you right there. You're outside. See, then you're powerless. The power that is from God is not on your life. Then when... And see, if you're looking for power, power to give, power to live, it comes from God. You can speak... Great swelling words about deliverance and how God has changed this and that and this and that and do great stuff like that. But you know what? When you're under this, it's all God that did it. You knew right, you recognize that. It was not that I prayed, now, now I'm fine. Or I prayed and now prayers were answered. No, it was God that did it. I was under His authority. But when I'm out here on my own, I can tell you my prayer life. I can tell you all the things I've done. I want to show you who I am. But when I'm under His authority, I don't need to show you anything. Why? Because it's God. It's not me. It's God. God is working on your behalf. And I tell you, there's people that have hang-ups and stuff in their lives and issues in their life that will never permit them to be completely under the umbrella of God because they're too stubborn to give up. Or they have hang-ups. God needs, in order to be under the headship of God or in the kingdom of God, it's kind of a dome here, and I think that the kingdom of God is somewhat of a dome as well. It's where he is king of a dome. And I'm under that dome. A kingdom. And he is king. It's not my favorite food, my favorite sport. No, no. None of those kings reign in here. None of these other gods that are under this umbrella. There is only one and he will not give it to anyone else. 
Now, if you walk out from under here, you can be intrigued with everything else. I mean, it's, it's just the world is full of stuff to like and love and have fun with. But you're powerless. You won't have power. And you come under the power of God, and now the power of God works on your behalf. You can pray, and prayers are answered. You can pray for sick, and the sick will recover. This happens under the authority of God. Fear of man, traditions of man. The offering of Cain is brought out here. You try your best. You, you say over and over, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do harder. I'm going to work harder so I can please God. Under here is where God is pleased with you. Not here. Here is where he's pleased with you. Do you see this? You can bring all kinds of fruits out here and bring all that. He's not looking for that. But under here you produce fruits. Here is where he's pleased with you. If you're looking for a place where God is pleased with you in your life, you try to work the works of Cain, no. This is where he's pleased with you. You see what I'm saying? The Bible says, If he that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Work harder out here to please God? No. Just get under his authority. Get under his authority. And that is done by repentance. You have every day, all day long, you have the option to be here or the option to be here. Some of us just want a little bit of our hand in here. And then we wonder why God doesn't work on our behalf. This is how it works. This is the way I understand it. I find that when I deal with demonic issues in people's lives, I mean, the devils, they can see whether a person is here. They said, Paul, I know, but who are you? They knew Paul was here. Yeah, you can act, you can act like a preacher, you can stand like a preacher, you can speak like a preacher, you can do all that and all. We can go through the motions of it all. But does the devil say, Who are you? Or is he say, Paul, I know, or yeah, I know you. You are under the authority of God. And I fear when you get around because God's authority over you will drive me away. You see the difference? This is, if you could have spiritual eyes to see actually what happens during the days you walk, this is what's going on. Day in and day out. Day in and day out. Men of God walk under the power of God. Uh, hypocrites. Bad attitudes. Bitter. Closets of hidden secrets. Fostering old hurts. Unforgiveness. Failing Failed testings and blaming others and private gods. Proverbs 29.2 When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. It doesn't say when the wicked are in authority because they aren't. The wicked are never in authority. Since Jesus died on the cross and overcome death, the wicked have not been in authority. God alone claims authority, and I want you to see that. And if, and if God's people, if the righteous are in authority, then the people will rejoice. And if you try to be in authority out here, the people will not be, rejoice. The power of God is not working through you and it's not visible through you. Um, I wish you could see all the pictures I have on my notes. Matthew chapter 7, 29. I'll go th I'll try to shorten this. Matthew chapter 7, 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes because he was under authority. See, they sat in the temples or they sat in the synagogues and, and here the scribes were repeating the, the Bible. And the Bible was saying this and this and this and, and this is what the Bible says and this is what the prophets were preaching. This is what the prophets said about the coming of Christ or etc., etc. But when Jesus came, they said... What is with this man? He speaks as one that has authority. He's not just repeating. It's something coming out of him. Why did Jesus have authority? Because he was under authority. Who was his authority? Tell me. It was the Father. And so all the power and authority that the Father had now came on Jesus. Especially when he got the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit fell on him, 
arrested upon him after the water baptism. From that point on, he had authority. He was completely under that umbrella. And he, they seen there's a difference in this man. Matthew 8, 9. Here's the centurion. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go. And he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus spoke about this last Sunday, but I want to show this to you. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Why was this such a great thing? This man said, Jesus, I don't want you to come to my house to heal my daughter. I believe it was his daughter. I don't want you to come to my house to heal my daughter because I'm not worth it. You step under my house. But I do understand that if you would just say, let her be healed or be healed, she would be healed. And Jesus, look at this. how is this? Oh, because I am also a man under authority. He didn't say in authority. There's a difference. When we're out here, we think we're in authority. When we're here, we're under authority. And Jesus seen that difference. The scribes, they were in authority. They thought they were, they had it. But they had no authority. But here he's seen this man saying, Oh, he said, you're seeing something. That's exactly how it works. So, because I, he's seen that Jesus was under authority. Because he knew that Jesus did not have that power on his own. There's power came from somewhere else. He did miracles. So where did it come from? We'll read about that a little bit later. So he said, so you just say, be healed. And I know that child's going to be healed because there's a power higher on your life than who you are at that point. Because I am under authority, I say to my servant, go and change a, go and unhitch this horse and put a white one in it and he'll do it. Because I'm under authority and I know that when that servant, now listen to me, when that servant says no, he don't fear me, he fears the king. If you are the person in authority and people fear you, then you know you're not under authority. If you cast a fear amongst your authority, you're not in authority. You think you are. But the person that you fear is, what does the Bible say about the fear of God? The fear of God is what we have. We know that we are under His authority. Do you get this? Some of you will never cast out a demon in your life because of this. You'll encounter people that have... And that, why am I talking about demonic issues? Because that's why I've talk, been talking about the kingdom. Or even pray for the sick or heal doing a miracle. By healing for, or praying for the sick and people get healed. It's because we're not under the authority of God. Sometimes when I'm moved to pray for someone, I'm embarrassed. When I notice that someone is sick and I have it on my heart to pray for someone, I'm a little bit embarrassed. You know what happens when I'm a little embarrassed? This. When I know sometimes that I've seen that a person had a, had a devil, it was obvious, had a devil. I didn't want to call it because I was afraid if I had called it and it wouldn't come out, then it would make me look bad. Mm -hmm. I was out here. But when you're under here, it's a different story. See, when you're under the authority of God, you see the way God sees. Because He, he shows you, and I'll show you that. I'll show you that in a verse. Let's take a little look, look again at this authority with the centurion. So the centurion said like this. He said that I am under authority. And he understood how it is to be under authority. He perceived that Jesus was under authority. And when Jesus was under authority, he knew that there was a power that much, was much higher than Jesus, which was the Father's authority. Now, at that point, remember, he did not, was not at the cross yet. He was still tempted in all points that we are. He did not overcome death yet. After he overcome death, 
Jesus is Lord from that point on, even Lord over death. Let me uh, just re read my note here. For many years I have seen a need to have authority and power in my life to set people free from, demon uh, from demons and evil spirits. And I noticed there are two things a man of God needs. Authority and power to expel demons. I've noticed that I've longed for not that I would be able to cast them out, but that those demonic powers could leave. To convince the gainsayer that bipolar people have demons. That's why it is. People that act with different characters have demons. That's the way demons do. They have all different kinds of personalities. I spoke to you about that. They have the different personalities. And today we call it, we've simplified it. And the church just believes it. They would argue it's not demons, but it's multi-personality disorder. That's a nice way, a scientific way of saying demons. That's what it is. It's demons. Devils want to live in people. Under here they can't. This is where they are. They get driven out under here. So my question is, why are so many people powerless in dealing with demonic issues or demons in people's lives? In fact, if I say this, every time I'm even using this word that about dealing with demons in people's lives, I have to step over a cross. I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. And I think most of you or some of you are thinking at the same time that I'm saying that. As you're, don't say that again. Preach about something else, not that. I feel that. I don't want to talk about it. But it faces our day. And in the kingdom of God, we are delivered from evil. And evil is who? Demons. Devils. The devil is evil. Sin too. But demons... I can talk about sin. It's not that big. When I say deliver from demons, it's like, oh, just shut up. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I, I, I hear it come before I say it. It's a spiritual thing. And as I sense that I don't want to say it, I'm sure that some of you are detesting what I'm saying. Hate to hear that. Get on another subject. That's the issue. Back in the days of Jesus, when someone had issues like we have today, he delivered them from demons. There was times when he delivered people from demons and they were healed. Why don't we see that today again? Because we have fancy titles for it. Here's the big problem. Nobody dares to come under the authority of God to call it what God calls it. So we have fancy medications that will numb people what it is and this is why this is why that I've seen this down through the years and I've known some people that and I'll give you an example one of the people that I knew was Derek Prince and I noticed that when he would speak against the devil in someone's life and ask him to come out they'd come out they would just respond but why is it that he had power like that and I did not have power like that and I did not want that power except I want those devils to go because they're making problems in that person's life. There was a burden of deliverance on me. Where is there anybody with an answer? So what do we do about it? Lord, whatever it costs me, do whatever you need to do in my life to bring me to a place or raise somebody else up. You know my heart. I don't need to be the person but somebody to deal with these issues. That natural and common man cannot deal with. This was a cry on my heart for years. Let's look at Luke chapter 4 verse 36. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits and they come out. Jesus, your Savior, 
Your head, the one that you are under, look at this, the one that you are under, you say you are. They noticed that he had authority and power that he could expel demons and they would come out. Unclean spirits would leave people. I said, they've not seen anything like this. This is unusual. They were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the evil spirits to come out. Why did the evil spirits come out when Jesus spoke? You say, well, it was Jesus. No, he was under authority. You'll say, uh-uh. Oh, yes. I'll show you a verse. He was under authority. In fact, Jesus even said he couldn't do anything by himself. Couldn't do anything by, even Jesus couldn't do anything by himself. Do you think we can? See, here's the problem, people. The subject today is generational authority. Authority down through the generation. This is part two. Generational authority. Having authority over generations to come. In the generation you live in today, in the generation that you will be a product of or that you will have to do with making another product of it. In other words, your future generations. Who will take care of issues like this when the people from 14 years under are the only ones in church anymore? The others have all died. Generational authority. These things are dealt with under the authority of God. And it has to be taught in our day. We have to be taught it. They have to be taught it. To walk under the authority of God in every way. Let me see here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 9. Starting in verse 1. If I can look past this handle here. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power... And authority. Not just power, not just authority. He gave them power and authority over a couple devils. No, all devils. If you look at the word devils here, it's demonians. It's not talking about the devil. There's only one, the devil. This is demons, all, over all demons. And to cure diseases. Cure diseases. So they won't come back again. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now friends, we live in a day today where there is TV evangelism that capitalize on the sick people for their money. And they beg you and beg you to send them seat money to because of you, because of you. You sent seed money, sent some seed money here. That's uh, seed money in faith. And if you give here, give me a hundred dollars, you'll get a hundred thousand, a hundredfold. And they persuade people into this. This is taking the gospel, what used to be a gospel, and taking advantage for their own kingdom. That is outside the authority of God. The way the Bible says here is he told them to go out and he told them, how to go. He said it very clearly. Don't make a big money thing out of this. Take nothing for your journey. You don't need a private jet. Neither take staffs nor script. Don't even need to take the Bible with you. It says neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats of peas. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the dust, the very dust from your feet, for a testimony against them. See, I'll read all the way up to verse 11. And they departed and went throughout the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, friends, today we're living in a day where people, like I said, they capitalize on the ministry of healing by making their own profit, adding to their own profit. That's not what this was all about. It was saying, take no money with you. All right, it's not about that. But neither the other ditch is this one, that we don't believe in healing anymore. We just believe in getting people saved and not in healing. That is not under the authority of God either. This kingdom supplies both. 
This kingdom of God gives salvation to people and healing to those that need it. You cannot divide those two. This ditch divides. Salvation is not important. It's all about healing. This, this ditch over here, all it does then, it's all under, outside the authority of God, is all about healing and not about salvation. But under the authority of God in the kingdom of God, there is both, and they walk together. There is salvation for the soul, and there is healing for the body. Now that's what Jesus did. And he is king. He is king, is he? Or do we have another king? Are we only partially under this? See, there's parts of our flesh that don't want to agree with that. But what does the Bible say? In order to believe what the Bible says, we have to come under this authority. Only then can we speak this. See, this is why people, well, okay, I kind of believe that maybe healing could be. It could be. Well, try to pray for a sick person. He won't be healed. You're not believing. You have to come under the authority of God. Let's, let's go on here. Some of you don't like what I'm saying. I don't either. But I'm under the authority, and I will speak about it. My natural flesh does not like to get on that subject because there is branding that goes on so quick. But it's the kingdom of God, and I will preach about it. My minister that God has ordained me to is not only a minister to be a pastor here, but is to also pray for those that are sick so that they can be healed. That is a minister that's been given. And under the authority of God, I'll walk there. If I'm the only one, if I'll be accused until I die, that's where I've been called to walk and I choose to walk there. I want to be under the authority of God. And only then can people be healed. Um, let, me, let me see here. Where did I leave off? Does anybody follow there? Okay. And they depart, what was it, seven? Yeah. Seven. How Herod, the Tetrarch, hurt of all that was done by him. They're saying, you know, Herod heard about all this, that there's, there's some men out there that are doing some things again. What's going on here? I thought we cleaned him up. His name was John. I thought we cleaned him up. And all at once he's saying, there's, there's some more people out there that are doing this. What do we make out of this? And that's kind of the background of it now. He's sending them out and saying, don't take anything with you. And they departed and went through the towns and preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch, Heard of, heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. And some, of the, some Elias had appeared, or Elijah, and to others that one of the old prophets had risen again. And Herod said, John, have I beheaded? He said, I've, I've beheaded John, so it's not him. But they said he came back. But who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see. Well, let's go out and look. Let's check this out. And the disciples, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. Returned back to Jesus. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethera. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he perceived them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that were in need of healing. He spake of the kingdom of God, and he healed them that needed healing. Do you like that? Where are you standing? Hmm? Maybe Sunday morning, and then quickly. Don't put my name under that. Friends, you have to become comfortable with God's authority. Yes, amen. To be under His authority. That's my only place we can walk. Yeah, but wait, wait, wait. No. I don't, yeah, according to what Wayne was preaching today, we're gonna, that's all going to be about healing from now on. Mm -hmm. You're right there too. <laughs> yeah. Pray for a sick person, they won't get healed. Because you have to be under His authority. I've observed this truth for many years. And I know exactly, when I'm praying for someone here, I know exactly where I'm at. You, you men do too. You know where you're at. 
We know how we, there's certain words that, oh, I struggle with it. There's a cross I'm crawling over to even say this when I pray this. No, I'm not. God, whatever it costs me, Lord, heal this person. They normally get healed. It's the authority that we are under. We have a misunderstanding of the kingdom. All right. We notice that Jesus was entirely under authority. You know, uh, authority, the word authority in Greek means delegated influence. He was under delegated influence. Jesus was entirely under delegated influence. He was influenced by heaven. He walked on earth. But he was about heaven. So much to that everybody that believes on him will go there. He was all about heaven. He was about God. He was totally and divinely under authority. He chose to walk there. John 5.20 I can of mine own self do nothing. Oh, he was Jesus. He could have, uh-uh. He said of my own self. That's here. Of my own self, I can do nothing. Then where did he have to go to do something? Here. Under the authority of God. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. As I hear, I judge. Most of us would say, as we see, we judge. As I see, I judge. What kind of clothes are you wearing today? Uh -uh. See, we judge by what we see. He said he judges by what he hears. Because he was under authority. Because someone with a higher authority spoke to him. Only while he was under this authority. Out here, God, why am I not hearing from you? You can pray a thousand prayers. Maybe God's very little overshadow at times. But when you come under God's authority, you hear what God says. Not what you think or what He thinks, but what God says. And that's the purpose. God says that He wants man to not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of who? God. We live by being under this authority. We live under it. Well, here's another thing. I've seen this in the past. Many, many churches today, they teach about authority. And the authority they teach about is that I'm under God and you are under me. You do what I say. That is this authority. You say you're under God. But when you are not under God, you have to tell people that you are in authority. When you are under God's authority, you're not going to talk about your authority. People will just notice there's authority with you because you are under the authority of God. It works invisibly. It works invisibly. I, God has put me in this church as a pastor in this church, and I will tell you, oh no. All you're saying is I'm out here, and I'm trying to control you. But when I walk only as a minister of the gospel, under the authority of God, God invisibly works through me and through those that are in this place, not only as ministers here, ministers there. Wherever we are called to minister, to minister under the authority of God, God invisibly works through us, and He gets the glory. Amen. I know that. I believe it. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear. I judge. My judgment is just. That's why. Because I seek not mine own will. But the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus came here not to seek his own what he wanted. What he thought. But he came to do the will of right here. That's what he did. He came to do the will of the Father. He came to dwell here. Under his authority. That's where he dwelt. Do you get that? 
How many times do I hear people that are professing Christians, they just cannot surrender their will? Oh, you're showing yourself a picture. I'm out here trying to be a Christian. You're going to struggle and struggle and struggle something terribly, and you won't be victorious. You're not here for your will. You're here for His will. Divinely for His will. If it costs you everything, this is where you're asked to walk. You will not have any power or authority unless you walk under this. It's the way it is. But I don't want to be there. Well, then you're here. It's not I struggle to get back out. No, you're just back out. This is where we are. Jesus found himself to be here in this place. He said, Paul said the same thing. He said that when I'm weak, then I sense I'm strong. When I'm in here doing only the Father's will, not my own will, not my thing, not what I think, I'm just weak. I look as, as a nobody. I, he said, I can't even speak with excellence of word. So when I'm weak, that's under here where I can't do any of my own, then I sense I'm strong. And it comes through the invisible God that works through him. You might, some of you might say no to this. But I can tell you your life. I can tell you your life. Notice that Jesus said, I did not come to seek, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of my Father. He does not seek his own will, but he seeks the will of the Father. Have you seeked the will of the Father in your life? Have you seeked the will of the Father? Or have you seeked what you wanted? I'm afraid they're going to ask me to come up here and pray for somebody. I don't want to. You're seeking your own will. Have you seeked the will of the Father? Sometimes we have to, so it doesn't work. But when we're under His authority, then it works. See, when you're entirely under authority... You are under the power of the authority that is over you. Now, I would like to, if I could, um, I, I hesitate. I hesitate mixing business with this stuff, but it's so much part of our life. How many of you are out here that are under authority in your business, in your job? You're under authority. How many of you are out here that are in authority? Why are you in authority? When I ask you, how many of you are in authority, then I'm asking you, can nobody fire you? When nobody can fire you, you are in authority. When you can be fired and you have authority, you're under authority. Because somebody over you has given you authority. And that authority stems all the way out to the, the new person that just started working the job. I know that there's people here that work for me. Numerous ones of you that work for me. And I know that they work for somebody that I gave authority to to run the business. And I don't run it. But I also know that when I go out there on that job and I see one of the employees uh, doing something, you know, I, I won't question because I know that the person I gave authority to run that or do that, they're under his authority, ultimately under my authority. I notice that. And what they do sometimes, even when I, I don't think they should be doing, I'll still bless that because I've given that authority to somebody else. And as long as I see that they are under my authority, I'm not as concerned when I see some things go a little left or right at times. But when I see the person I've given authority to is not under my authority, then it's, whoa, now wait a minute. Then I don't trust about anything he does. Roy and Mike in this case. If I see that they're not under my authority, I, I, then I'm, oh, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. I told them this and they're not doing that and that they're not under my authority. Then I get a little cautious about everything I see. I think it's the same way right here. But when you are under authority, see, 
That's where you can bind and lose. The Bible says that. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you, whatsoever you will lose on earth, you will also lose in heaven. Now, that doesn't happen out here. We have actually looked at that verse and found that it's basically a verse that doesn't mean anything because we don't see examples of it working. Why? Because people are not under the authority of God. But when someone is under the authority of God and prays, there was a while back, I can't use names, a while back someone said, a statement was made, you know, I'm, I'm starting to be very careful what I pray for because it just works every time. There was this man that prayed that a certain business would close down because it was not giving glory to God. And it did. A matter of two weeks later, it was closed down. It's like, ooh, be careful. And I see that same thing with God. When God said, let there be light, it didn't hesitate. There was light. When Jesus cast out a devil, they left. It happened. Now, are you saying that we should be and have all the authority that Jesus had? Let's bring Smith Wigglesworth into this picture. Does somebody know the words that Smith said about the Word of God? You don't need... What was it, John? I think I heard you repeat that. What was it that he said? You only need the Word. You only need the Word. You only need the Word. Who is the Word? See... You only need the Word. Who is the Word? The Word is Jesus. And where is, it? where is that? It's God. God in flesh. All you need is the Word. And believe the Word. You have to be under the authority of the Word. And look what all, what all he did. The miracle worker that he did. He, he, he led thousands more people to Christ than he healed. He was an absolute soul winner for God. But the media didn't show him that way because it wasn't as exciting for him. He was a great, one of the greatest soul winners I've ever read about. Literally thousands. He was out there doing it every day. Winning people to Christ. Winning people to Christ. Praying for him. Some rebel walking up to him and saying, you need Jesus. Uh, no, you need Jesus. And he just, God in heaven, save this poor soul. And he'd pray until the man started weeping and crying and repentant. Turned his life over to Christ. That's the kind of power that worked through him, I believe, because he was under the authority. He didn't care what man thought. He had power with God. And there's people in the, that we know Moses had power with God. That God was, you see, <clears throat> when someone is under my authority, and I'm not speaking church now, I'm speaking business, under my authority, there's times when they persuade me to change my idea about something. Okay, I'll, mm -hmm, okay, yeah, you've convinced me. I think the same thing we see with God, too, concerning Abraham and Lot. I'm, I'm just hoping I can stir something in your hearts, that you understand why some people have power and authority and others don't. The reason people don't have authority is because they're not under authority. That's just as clear as that. But why do some people have power and not others? Do we, do we, do you perceive the truth that, that um, when someone is under authority, he is under a higher power than he can be himself? Do you perceive that? Do you understand that? When someone is under authority, see, when I'm out here away from authority and I'm on my own, this is my own thing, all the power that I have is what I have. That's all I got. And that's nothing. I can try to persuade. I can then try to use great eloquent words to try to convince you that and make an impact upon your life, but nothing happens on the inside because this work is a spiritual work. But when I am under authority, I operate under a authority and power and privilege that is higher than me. This is why some of you people cannot overcome sin. You are not under authority. And that higher, higher power that you need to be an overcomer, you don't have. You can try to repent a thousand times, but until you come under the authority of God, you will not have victory. It's the way it is. 
We have to come completely under the authority of God all the time and surrender under it, not in a, oh, I wish I wouldn't be here, but this is a most blessed place. I surrender to Christ. I surrender my thoughts. I surrender my intentions. I give it all up. I only seek the will of God, not my own. I long for His will, not mine. It doesn't have to be my way. I want His way. Just His way. Loving to be under the will of God. Under the, under the authority of God. Matthew 28, 18. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Jesus said that. I spoke about that last Sunday. All power is given unto me. Now he doesn't say authority. He says power. He changed that name here. He was under authority. And under that authority, he was given power. And that was the power to send. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power that heaven had and that earth had was given to him. He said, now go. Acts 6, 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And this was after Pentecost. Stephen did great... Who was Stephen? Someone know who was Stephen? Who was he? He was an evangelist, right? Is there anybody in here that has the call... Or the burden to be an evangelist. Not necessarily stand up here and preach or something. But that is the thing that is in you. Oh for souls. Oh for souls. Oh for souls. Lord our sister. You pray. That's what you think during the day. Yesterday I walked past a man. that does some work in a certain specific uh, thing. That he does certain type of work. And I said, huh, I didn't know you do this kind of work. He says, oh, you didn't. He's my neighbor. I said, you didn't know this. I said, well, I heard you were dabbling around a little bit in this kind of thing. It was some kind of a special thing that it does. It's a product. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's not a health product, nothing like that. It's just a, a service, um, like concrete work, something like that. And I said, I didn't know you do this. And he says, oh, yeah. He said, I, I dream about it. I sleep about it. In other words, he left the impression, it's all over him. This kind of an evangelistic cry, does it come to your heart? Oh God, I see a need in this person's life. And you pray about it and you cry about it. To give you an example of what happened with this little evangelist, so-called. He didn't last very long. But he said he was full of faith and full of power. And because he was full of power and full of faith... He did great wonders and miracles among the people. I want to speak to your heart, whoever you are today. Whoever you are today, you might think miracles only belong to people up here behind the pulpit. No, they don't. They belong to people that are under the authority of God. Some of you say, oh, God could never do a miracle through my life to touch someone else. That's the work of the enemy. That is not under the authority of God. As much as Stephen has been called for this, so you can be called, and perhaps are called. And it can be amongst the least of you that have not even a significant gift. Or maybe a product history of defeat for many years. But what's God saying? Not what do you think, but what's God saying? I appreciate how John got up this morning and with authority he led out in worship. More so than normal, John. And I wondered if vacation was good for him or if he met somebody on his path. He spoke with authority. He had something in him. And he took that ministry serious today. And did I love that. John, that is tremendous. Walk under that authority. In our Christian life, whatever you're called to be or do, it doesn't have to be pronounced over you. You don't have to have a special laying on of hands, perhaps for a certain ministry that is formed in your heart. Walk under the authority of it, and God will do exploits. 
God can do miracles through you. The problem is not who you are, it's where you are. We think it's because who I am. My product history, my past history. I've had a lot of things, look who my dad is, who, who my mom is, who my family is. No. It's not who you are, it's where you are. The devil would like to tell you it's who you are. It's the name that has been attached to you. You'll never amount to anything. Not out here you won't. But under here things get transformed. Under the authority of God. There are some of you people that are here, you have good hearts. I could name good hearted people. Faithful people. But you have diminished the grace of God by not believing that God could do anything through you. It's unbelief. God wants to use you as servants. Hear my words. I plead with your heart. I'm very serious about what I'm saying. I believe the enemy has fed in lies into some of your lives. And as long as you believe that, you're not going to be used by God. Some of you have the burden. You cry out. Yesterday, last night... <coughs> It was so heavy on me when I seen that the liar that speaks to God's people because they're outside his authority and they, they, they get deceived by untruth thinking that I had a start in God. I had a start. It was a good, wonderful moments that I had. The Lord did great work through me. He did a real big work in me, but I'm done now. And I wept for some of you because I believe that you have been believing lies that come from the enemy. Because you have looked at who you are and not where you are. And I want to encourage you and speak to your heart this morning. Get under the authority of God. You might have been discouraged. Somebody might have given you words that have brought defeat in your life. And I'm speaking to you. But this morning it's not about that. It's about what God says. You have come to do the will of God. Not to please others. God will never use you in a great way. As long as you believe those things. But if you come under the authority of God. That's where things change. Some of you have been listening to your wife's words. Some of you have been listening to your husband's words. I'm not against women, you know that, but I believe there's many men been disqualified in the kingdom of God as ministries because of their wives. Because they've never become spiritual. And I also believe vice versa. What is God saying? It's not what do you think. What is God saying? I want you to take this challenge to all of you in your own personal life. What is God saying about your life? And the other thing is, what has he burdened you with? It is often what he burdens you with is what he's called you to. You say, well, the burden left me. Yeah, because you've walked away from the call. But what has he called you? You remember those precious moments and precious times when you found Christ or when he found you and that original thing that just burned in you. It's called the first love. That's what he calls you to. And when you're disobedient to that, it'll go away. The calling stays, but the feeling, the burden goes away. The fire goes away. The love goes away. Then you kind of think God changed his mind. No, it's not what it is. You allowed your heart to be changed because you went out from under the authority of God. Now something else works. Now you have to muster on your own power. You have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you're often down because of that. Oh, do we have something to learn about that? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Next Sunday I'd like to speak about the anointing of God. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And when God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, how did he do? 
What did it work in him? He who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He went out on the pastor after his anointing, and he healed all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So when people are oppressed of the devil and they cannot find relief when you pray for them and when you're around them, what is wrong? Maybe you're not anointed for it. Well, what is anointing? All it says here is when God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost, he had power in his life. He was under the authority, but then he had power, and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And in closing, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians and read from chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 1 through verse 9. Hallelujah. This is always a precious f form of Scripture. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came I not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. See, some of you people here think that you, have, you, have, you can't speak well enough to be anything. Well, Paul wasn't only that way in thought. He was that way as a person. That's what it says. He came not with excellency of speech or of special certain wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. But he simply said what he had. Oh my Lord, can you make these people hear this? Can you make these people hear this, Lord? That the least amongst us God is not looking for the great eloquent ones. He's not looking even for the ones with great experience and all that. He's looking for little David boys up on the mountains. Taking care of nothing spiritual, just sheep. That's it. Because there is giants. I don't know, I have an issue with my speaker thing here. Battery going dead or something. All this Maybe try to, if you can excuse that, we're almost done. You might be a, a David, but I can change this to this if you want me to. Maybe the umbrella shielding radio waves here too. You might be little David boy, thinking that even, even when the anointer came to the house to anoint somebody king, that all you'll ever be, they didn't even invite me to the home because I'm nobody special. All I am is a little shepherd boy up on the hill. I wonder why they didn't invite me because the anointer is coming to the home. You see, God brought him down. It doesn't matter who you are. You might be the least. If you have a call on your life and if you have a burden in your heart, you've got to heed to it. You've got to heed to it. And some of you that have had a burden originally in your life many years ago, and it has burned in your heart, and little by little you thought, well, it's not for me, I don't think this and that. And maybe you walked out away from the authority of God. Where are you today? What is happening in your life? Let's read on here. Not with excellency, anything. For I... For I determined not to know anything among you. I am determined to know nothing special. No special nothing. Save Jesus Christ and the power of Him being crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my, in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But in demonstration of spirit and of power. And that's what's lacking in today's church. We have all the eloquence. We have all, all the technology. We have all the conveniences. We have schools. We have colleges to teach people how to preach. We can go on the internet and print out a message what to preach. You can have everything, everything, everything. But the thing that is missing is something that Paul had. He might, you might have every word right, you might have every name right, you might have every, every idea right, you might have every doctrine right, you might have it all right, but one basic thing that might be missing in you, and that is the power to change someone else's life. 
There is no power in demonstration of God's Spirit. Back in those days, the demonstration of God's Spirit was where people repented. And when they found Jesus, and when people were healed. That was a direct demonstration of God's Spirit. When you cannot explain it away. When you have to say, it must have been God. See, we walk out from the authority to learn how to. And Paul said, I wanted none of that. I don't want the I know how to's. I just want to be under the Christ cross and Him crucified in your life. Because that's where the victory is. You have to live the crucified life under here. There's no other way. You cannot live under this, under this shield of absolute glory of God without being under the cross. I tell you by experience, you cannot Desire to do the divine will of God with, with regardless of cost without the cross. You can't be under his authority without the cross. He was so convinced on that. He said, that's what I'm about. I can write every word out and make the best impression upon you. But if I can't change your heart, I've done nothing. That's what he was saying. So he didn't come with all that. All he longed for is demonstration of the Spirit. And today, when we conclude this service, I have a big question. What was the demonstration of the Spirit of God today? Was there a demonstration at all that we know and are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a Holy Ghost and that there is a God in heaven because of the power that we've seen today in the church? It has to be that. It has to be that. Whether it comes by the form of healing or people turning to repentance or people having their lives freed with God through Christ. It has to be that. The church will die unless we see the life of the Holy Spirit in it. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We have to see the demonstration of the Spirit of God, not the eloquence of words. Do you hear? And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech was not, and my preaching was not with enticing words, certain ways to get you to the altar. Oh, have I seen that stuff of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the demonstration of power. An absolute demonstration of the Holy Ghost and a demonstration of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That your faith stands where? Not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Oh, glory. How bit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to know it. And I'd like to stand here today and, and admire. I, I really, I really want to say this. Oh, if somehow God could help me. How I love to see some of you perfect people. And I'm not saying it in any way except what I mean. Some of you are perfect in God's eyes. Absolutely perfect in God's eyes. That's the way God sees you. You are under His authority. That's where you operate. You've surrendered your own will. You don't want your own will. You want only His will. You long just for Him. You are divinely under His will, under His authority. He says this, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9. Oh, listen to this, friends. If you'll forget everything I've said today, listen to this little portion right here that's coming. But as it is written, I has not seen. Some of you have not seen this. And I will say like this, nobody has seen this. You can put forth your best imagination. You will not cause yourself to see this. You can paint the best picture that you want to in your life. You cannot cause yourself to see this one. It says, I have not seen and your ears haven't heard either. 
Uh, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. There is absolutely nobody in here that has figured it out, that has an understanding of all the things that God wants you to walk in while you're living here. It's not talking about heaven coming in the future. It's talking about here living with God right now. It's about experiencing the glory of God and the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God right in the world you live in today. Your eye has not seen it. Your ear has not heard it. It has not entered into your heart. All the things that I've said today has nothing to do with what he's saying here. You can live and you can walk in the most glorious place under the authority of God. Where God works on your behalf. Do you understand that right? Where prayers are answered. Where miracles are done. You say, yes, I know. Well, you heard me say that. But let me say this. What I just said, or whatever entered into your heart. See what it says here? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. You didn't just hear it. Nor has entered in the heart. What God has prepared for them that, where is it? Love Him. Some of you people are saying, you're saying, you're making this so complex. How can I find out? How can I find this way? There's only this whole verse and everything I'm saying is hinged on to one little word. Loving God. It's not sending you to school. It's not being under my teachings for six months. On solid teaching and how to, how to, how to. No, it's not. It's in loving God. When you love God, God unveils. See, when you love God, some of you, some of you love God, but you love Him out here. Because it gets a little convicting and hot under here. So you go back out here. You don't want to repent. You want to get rid of things in your life. You want to unveil yourself. But under here is where you love God. All at once you just love God. God, you just love God. You love the power of God. You love the fire of God. You love the purifying fire of God. You love the ways of God. You love God. And when you love God, He says, if you love me like that, I'm going to show you some things. I'll show you things that the preacher hasn't spoken about. And if he even spoke about it, you didn't hear it through what he said. I'll start showing you things. Do you hear me? And I would like to say this as a record, I guess, to my day. When I pass on, that I will tell you this, the Lord has shown me things. And I'm not speaking about anything Mystical. But the Lord has shown me areas and places under His authority. Marvels and wonders of where and how and who we are. And what all He is doing for us and through us and in us. And all the promises that are hinged on Him. That I can have and receive Him in my life. And have Him as an experience under His authority. From jobs to everything there is. But you've got to be under the authority of God. You can't say, yeah, but, but, oh, well, then you're out here. Then the only power that works is what you have. And that's nothing. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. This verse is concluding this, if I could say it this way. God has things prepared for you to walk in this life. One of those things is man does not live by bread only, but he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's spiritual people will always live not by what they can do, what they can make. They will live divinely under every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And they hang on to that. That's their life. That's their future. That's their going. It's the promises of God. What God has promised, you can live by it. But you need to have faith in it. Some of you are having issues with jobs. Even in a down economy, when you are under the authority of God and you believe His Word, He will do miracles. Our problem is we want miracles out here, but we don't want to give it all up. We need to be under the authority of God. And when you are under the authority of God, 
You will start believing and eating His Word. And when you eat His Word, you will live. And that's how we have our going. If I could somehow explain to you that the Word of God, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, is like a stair step. Every stair has His Word. We believe that Word takes us to the next step. We believe that word takes us to the next step. And these are things of God supplying our need. These are things concerning jobs, concerning marriage, concerning everything there is. If it comes out of the word of God, if it is the word of God, you have to believe it. And under here you will believe it. Because it is your own going. It's the only way you go on. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Oh, you need to hear this. This is part of the gospel. But it doesn't come into the ear and into the heart what God has made all these privileges for us because it doesn't come that way. Oh, how does it come? Let's look at the next verse. There is a way that it comes. It says, But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. The Holy Ghost reveals these things to us. For the Spirit searches all things, ye the deep things of God. The Holy Ghost knows everything. He does. He knows everything. He even knows something that Jesus doesn't know. Do you know that? Believe that? If the Holy Ghost, if Jesus would know, let me think here a little bit. Jesus does not know when the Father will tell him to come back. Because he said if he would know, he would tell us, then we'd know. Let me think here, am I wrong on that one? For some reason I've had, this is a thought that just, I've said it before, I'm thinking, do I have the horse turned the, the wrong way here? Let me think here. The Holy Ghost was the one that went into the land of forgetfulness. Yes, this is why the Holy Ghost, this is why you cannot sin against the Holy Ghost. Because he cannot forget. He has led Jesus into the land of forgetfulness and to take away our sins. We're talking about the Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the Holy Spirit, I believe. Anyway, let's finalize this subject. Brothers and sisters... You might have needs in your life today. And you could spell them out, whatever those needs are. What are they? I was amazed. Let me, let me speak to some of you single ones' hearts. I was amazed. Here a while back when I was down in North Carolina, where I was preached several messages. How many young people have drawn a conclusion in their life by a word that was spoken to them, you will never get married. And that thing haunts them. You know what? It has made that in their lives. They have not been married to this day. Some were quite old. But somebody told them one time that they will never get married. you like that. If you're like that, you'll never get married. And they always, they just believe that, oh, I'll never get married. And they were never married. There's some of you single ones in here that have that same voice in you. Something has told you you'll never get married. You might have messed up somewhere, and now you're just saying you'll never get married. And I had to pray people through and saying, oh, no. That's not what God says. What is God saying? That's just a practical application. But now let me ask you, what is God saying about your life? Is what, what, what is the voice that you're listening to right now? Have you been listening to, I'll never mount anything for God? Have you been saying that I'll never be able to be used by God? What are some of the things that you have in your life that you are holding on to that is not the Word of God? It's controlling you. It's keeping you out from the authority of God. Let me ask you, what has God spoken to your heart? What is God saying in your heart? That's what you live by. What has He said? Has the voice become faint? Was it many years ago where you messed up something and you think you messed it up for good and God will never use you again? Is that what you're hanging on to? Then that's the way you're going to have it. 
What are you listening to? Whose words are you believing? We are to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of our neighbor. No. Out of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of my sister. No. Out of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of my mom or my dad. No. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now I ask you the question, what has God spoken to you? That's what you're going to live by. What has He spoken to you? Do you believe what He said? Or do you choose to be out here and believe what someone else has said? You don't live by other people's words. You live by what God says. That is being under the authority of God. You might have a bad history, friend. This morning you might have a bad history. You might have a history of failure financially or whatever it is. Just an absolute failure. You might look to yourself as I've never amounted to anything. Anything I've ever done has always been wrong, has always not worked. And you've concluded that to be a word. And it works in you and keeps you in that very spot. And it's become a stronghold in your life. But what is God saying? What is God saying? You might have an issue with healing. Something that is wrong in your life or in your body. You've had issue for a long time. And people have told you it's impossible to be healed by that. But what's God saying? You will live by the word of God. But you will die by the word of man. What's God saying? What is he saying? Will you choose to be under his authority and believe his word? Or will you be out here by yourself, only under your own source and your own strength, trying to be a Christian? Trying to be a Christian. Or will you be under His authority as a Christian? Do you hear me? What has God said? You know the words, I believe in Exodus. Where God said the reason that the children of Israel were taken through the wilderness was to teach them that man does not live by bread only, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's exactly the reason that the children of Israel were taken through the wilderness. And some of you have been going through wilderness and wilderness and wilderness and wilderness because God is simply trying to teach you that you will only live by my word, not by man's word, or by your own opinion, or not by your past life. You will live by my word. And when I say something, that is what I ask you to take a hold of and receive that and believe it. Do you hear me? The opposite of that is called unbelief, and that's why the children of Israel could not enter. Because they were in unbelief. They would not believe that God, what God said, that He meant what He said. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I, if, if I could tell you this, this is a gold mine. I'm not saying dollar bills. That's all I'm saying. This is the success to Christianity. This is the gospel. Listen. What have you been believing? Under what authority have you been receiving these words that have come to you? Your moms and dads might disagree with who you are, where you are, where you're going. Even where you're going to church. But is it the word of God? They might have spelled stuff on top of your head. You will never amount to anything. You're spiritually deceived. But I find you in church this morning. What have they been saying? My question is, what has God been saying? Which one are you living by? Under this authority, we learn to live and have our going. All by the word spoken. And that's the word of God. Do you hear me? I sense a, a weeping over my heart for you. Like, like Jesus said when he looked at Israel and he said, oh, oh, he said, how many times would I have gathered you with my wings? But you would not. He said, no. You choose to hang on to what you've been told, not what has been spoken. You might not... You might not receive this word today. But oh God, take this word and make it life to him sometime. This is the success of the Christian walk. It might not be the gospel you've ever heard. 
but it's the gospel that Jesus lived. How many times would I have liked to help you out of your predicament, but you wouldn't believe me? You believe what others said. The curse of words. People, let's believe God. Let's come under the authority of God. Come in here. You might not be very big, but you can be under the authority of God, regardless what it costs. This is where I want to be, and I will be here. And when you come under here, you come away from all those voices that are out there. Just, this is where you are. And the whole God of heaven that has wandered the universe, that understands all history, that has seen and observed everything, knows exactly how many hair every one of us has on our own head, will have to turn all at once and look at this wicked heart that at one time was so wicked. And he'll look when he sees a heart that is contrite and broken and one that trembles at his word. And all heaven, all God and all history that is enfolded in God will turn your way and look where he cannot hold back when he sees that man that has a broken and a contrite heart and one that trembles at his word. You can make God move. God looks into your heart and he says, oh, oh. And he'll have to come your way. Or you're going to be like that. And that's how he'll be. The authority of God. Friends, where are you today? Are you under the authority of God? Some of you women in your home, under, are you under the authority of your husband? That's the authority that God has set over you. Mm -hmm. Are you under your husband? That's the authority God has set over you. When you are under their authority, you are in authority. See? Father, I pray that this word would penetrate so much deeper. Oh God, Lord, oh Lord, the importance of this word. Oh, if I could only speak the things that I know, but words are not lawful. Father, to see the secret, the secrets and the mystery of God, to speak it and to to, to be able to live and understand and to walk in the word of truth. The word that you have spoken. Unbiased, unmolested by man's deception and trying to twist things to fit them. But to be surrendered under the power and the authority of God. O oh Lord, to live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Not only one word, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God do we live by. Not by bread and sweat that we make ourselves. No, but every word. And Father, I pray that today, if you could somehow come into these lives and resurrect that original word, that old lost love perhaps that first love oh God that stirred deep in the hearts of men and women when they found you first and clear and clean oh Father I pray that you could stir within them that first love that first word oh God and that they would stand with that word and believe that word oh God and come back to life Oh, Lord, I pray for that. I pray, oh God, I pray that you might give us another chance. Speak to our hearts and speak to our lives when we go home, Lord. Make it real and make it hot for us, oh God. There's people that are stooped in habits and ideas and traditions, oh God, that have been lingering on to them. And there's voices that tell them they'll never be free. God, I speak against that in the name of Jesus, Lord, because I know that there is fullness deliverance in your word and in the work of Christ. Lord, you've said it, you've spoken it, and we live by it, and we believe that. 
Father, I pray for miracles to be done. I pray for miracles to be done. Things that man's hand is too short, that man cannot fix, that man cannot touch. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you might allow people to return back to the Word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and to hang on to it, O oh God, and believe it, and to proclaim it and speak it, O oh God, until it becomes life to them. Father, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Father, fulfill your word. Fulfill your work in our last day. In this day of deception, O God, fulfill your word. Do marvelous things. Do exploits, O God. Do miraculous things, O God, that people will know that there is still a God and that there is still a Holy Ghost. Father, I pray this. I pray this, O God, from the bottom of my heart in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let it ring out. Let it not, let it not go to naught, oh God. And I cling on to this word that you've spoken, that my word will not return unto me void. You've spoken the word today, oh God, and your proclamation has been that it will not come back void. But it will go out and it will do that which you've designed it to do. And Lord God, I believe that. That's your word. I believe that word. Today, Lord, you will cause people to come out of their graves. You will cause it to come out of their graves that have been stooped into death where the bones are dry, Lord. You will cause them to live because of your breath, O oh God. The breath of your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Blow upon your people. Blow upon them with your power. With great glory and great might, O oh God, in this last hour we live in. I pray this in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.